Um, also, guys, make sure if you notice the hashtag, we're going to be live tweeting some of the really interesting points that we're making. So if you want to take part in the discussion or don't feel comfortable raising your hand, Emily over here is monitoring all of that fun stuff. And then later on after the event, if you have questions or whatnot and want to engage with us, all the handles are there. And just hashtag digital storytelling DC. Uh, Nicole? Yeah, sure. I'm Mikkel Pasternak, um, Chief Experience Officer at HUGE. Uh, if you haven't heard of HUGE, we are about a 700-person uh, agency that really believes that we can affect uh, change in brands and businesses by thinking about the user first. Um, so I've been with HUGE for almost 10 years. It was about 10 people uh, when we started there. And I actually have a background in, in uh, mechanical engineering and, and robotics. Cool. Matthew? Yeah. Uh, my name is Matt Stevenson. I'm the creative director at Fathom here. Uh, I work five feet away from Timor. <laughs> uh, I lead a team of thinkers and dreamers and designers. Uh, and we do a lot of stuff for a lot of different clients, especially around DC, a lot of NGOs, a lot of nonprofits uh, non and government sectors, love a lot of PR support, uh, ranging from brands to basic design stuff to presentations and websites. Uh, you name it, we, we sort of take care of it. Okay, awesome. And I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm Tamar Tucker, as you see on my fabulous name tag. Uh, I'm the director of marketing here at Fathom Creative. Um, so a lot of the fun social things that we organize and put out via our brand channels um, comes through myself and Emily, of course, with the support of our creative team. And then we also work with a very creative approach to support the similar clients, uh, larger PR firms, nonprofits, NGOs. Um, associations, startups, you name it, uh, to build out a more strategic and very creative uh, digital communications plan, um, in essence. So that's, in a nutshell, what I do. Um, I'm going to dive in, though, to some questions. Um, I'm going to start with Lauren. So Lauren, what trends are you noticing that digital communities are responding to most? Um, well, I'm like just the big infographics, data visualization person and that's really what I wanted to be able to speak about tonight. I should definitely differentiate myself from these wonderful creative people up here because I draw stick figures, right? But <laughs> in terms of research and being able to understand how to utilize some of the types of things that they work with, that's really where I come into play. So it's all about, I think, you know, the infographic, um, particularly in the private sector. I'm seeing it just now kind of beginning to move more into on the public sector. And I think this is because, of course, we're all overwhelmed by information. I saw a recent study done by Wharton Business School that says that we consume over 100,000 words after work, right? So imagine what happens like during work and you're on your phone and screens and everything else. So infographics are obviously rising because it's just simply an easier and quicker way to be able to communicate information, but also because, you know, it's just uh, better retained, right? As we're talking about image, and we'll get more, you know, kind of deeply into that. I think that this is a, a huge, um, a huge reason behind um, the infographic trend. But I think it's going to start to change as we see things, uh, some other things come into play, which I'll talk about a little bit um, later on today. But this is like, I think, going to be something that um, those in the public sector start to jump on a little bit more, and um, we'll utilize. Most certainly, we recently did a couple for the World Economic Forum, which you know just recently took place, um, and they were very well received. Even a little too heavy in text, in my opinion, but I'm not going to you know, argue. Baby steps, right? <laughs> World Baby Economic steps. Forum. But a lot of organizations, such as those, are trying to figure out how do we move from white papers to something which can be um, consumed, where they just have tons and tons of very interesting and relevant information but not communicated in a way that's relevant, right? So that's really the challenge, and we'll talk more about that. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is like the underlying, the underlying theme is all about content and ways of projecting that content. So exactly. McCall, I have a question for you. Do you think organizations of all types should be curating creative content, and if so, why? Yes, uh, so kind of uh, building on that, and there's a couple things. So one, uh, given that everyone has limited time and our attention is that valuable, uh, it's becoming harder and harder for any one company to kind of cut through that clutter. And what we've seen as a company is, is almost all of our clients have a core business that has nothing to do with digital. 
um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, stores that were a brick and mortar operations suddenly have to react and, and create an online store. Or uh, you look at a uh, working with a life insurance company. You know, they sell life insurance. They're very good at that, uh, but they have no idea how to create meaning in a digital world. And they see the next generation of people when they're ready to buy life insurance are not necessarily going to walk up to a broker first. And, you know, because of the digital behavior that we're seeing, people want to get to know some, a company first online. So, uh, for a lot of, it's become a very big part of, of our work is helping companies transform so that they can be more ready and create content that's valuable. And the other really important piece is people aren't coming directly, let's say, to a life insurance website uh, out of hand unless someone has mentioned it to them, something like that. So. People need to create those tentacles. It's essentially content marketing, right? Um, and it's super important. And infographics, I think, are becoming a big part of that, largely because the other thing we know in user experience is people are incredibly lazy and they don't like to read. Uh, you know, maybe if they're sitting down to read a nice New Yorker article or a Post article, they're going to read. But uh, for the most part, it, you know, it's scanning and looking at the bullets and that kind of thing. And that's where things like in infographics can be can tell you a story in a short and meaningful way that's that's memorable. And, and Okay. If they're done right, and we'll talk about mm -hmm. totally. <laughs> well, the execution is, is not a small thing. To, right. to tail along that theme, and I'm going to ask you another question. You brought up, you know, the post Washington. Um, how could civic organizations improve their web presence outside of infographics, and what are the necessary subsequent activities for them to stay relevant or to stay being used? So uh, I think it's it's really really similar. We actually have a great case study on this that I'm, I'm going to be speaking about tomorrow as well, uh, which is NYC.gov. So we just redesigned it and launched it right when healthcare.gov launched, which was amazing for us. <laughs> it was successful. Is the good news. Uh, one of the biggest things that that we worked on with them was differentiating what people were actually coming there for, which was like paying a parking ticket or finding their towed car, which just happened to me today. Uh, that's my own fault though. Uh, and, or versus, you know, and maybe looking up information about where their kid came from school, that kind of thing, um, versus the other basic function of government, which is to inform people. But people were not coming there to read dry press releases, which is all NYC.gov was giving people. So we worked with them a lot on uh, both their storytelling in terms of writing, don't write a dry press release geared at the press, write something that people can read and might want to read, and, and a lot with their imagery and, and statistics. So they had essentially, when there was an image at all, it was always Bloomberg on the podium, the same exact <laughs> shot. You could just scan down the page when you would see a, a picture. It was, it was like they could just use one image. Uh, so we worked with them a lot on showing different types of photography and the goal was really let's make it really easy for someone to achieve the thing they came for and hope that we might catch their eye and, and get them to read something and actually in our research that's what we found and in my personal use that's actually what started to happen on a good day you know when they're when they're yeah. using a, a good image and yeah. stuff. well that's great that nyc.gov is sort of used as a as a home base for a resource for people in nyc to come to um, for both administrative type things, parking tickets, or informative type things are happening. Um, I feel like the Washington Post is very similar in that aspect that people in Washington or all over the world will come to your website um, to be told a story or as a resource for something. So, Sarah, you're up next. You're, you're in the hot seat. Um, does the process of breaking down stories and specific types of news events um, enhance the emotional aspect and digestibility of content, do you think? I mean, I hope so. I think um, it's not unlike what Kelly was just describing. I think, like any anything that you're trying to communicate to people, you just have to get outside of like stuff that you know. Like, there's reporters that know. Like, you could just talk about the election in 1986 in Kansas City, and Dan Balls would be like, "Oh yeah, that was so and so." And like. You know, you have to like get outside of the fact that maybe you're a really big expert on this thing, but like the person that's reading it isn't. And how do you break that down into a way that makes a lot of sense yeah. and, and, and makes it easy for people to understand larger themes? And I mean, that happens with extended stories all the time too. Like, you know, the Ukraine thing. Like if you were on vacation for two weeks, you probably have no idea what's going on in Ukraine. But like, there's been people that have been reading it and keeping up to date on it. Yeah. So like Every how do you, right? Yeah. So and it changes that fast. So like how do you how do you sort of keep those people happy that are like super expert at what's going on there mm -hmm. versus the people that are like why is everyone talking about the Ukraine? So I have a, I have a, <laughs> you brought up the Ukraine and 
So I'm going to ask the audience and, of course, the panel as well, when, when you hear the Ukraine, there's obviously potentially a certain sentiment towards what's happening in Ukraine. You're either one way or another, you know, like not a fan or uh, indifferent. So I have a follow-up question for you um, based on the digital storytelling, of course. Um, is there a greater risk of swaying readers or of being non-objective by the digital storytelling? Mm, I'm sure there is. I think like, you, you just have to be very careful about that. That's why we have like experts in that field to make sure that we're not doing that. And I think you know, the comment streams on our site will tell you different, but like, we really try to be. <laughs> We really, really try to not have that happen. And I think, you know, the fact that newspapers have editorial columnists that have opinions and they can be left or right, like I think that confuses some, sometimes the people that are reading the site, what's opinion and what's not. Um, but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Actually going off that, I, I just started thinking of like, has that affected the way you guys tell the story and the fact that people can like talk back via the comment section? Sometimes, um, sometimes there's a commenter that is mentioned in the story, and they're like, "That's not true," or "That's not what happened," or um, "Yeah, it, it does." I think in the last couple of years, we've seen a lot more successes with reporters and bloggers interacting with the comments. Um, whether that's just jumping in there and, and talking to these people and having a dialogue, or if that's reaching out on Twitter or other means, and I think that that has helped kind of build stories with. We found sources out of that. We found, you know, different types of leads that maybe we could pursue about something. Um, but yeah. So I think it's a good question. How important are analytics um, to you? Uh, I was thinking in terms of the in, um, Ukraine, the post um, website had photos of I think two or three weeks ago. There were a number of like young young guys mainly um, dressed up to defend themselves from attack in gas masks and makeshift armor, you know, they were gonna get clubbed and beat. Um, does that get a lot more hits and clicks and are people reading that? The other one that I remember and I think it was probably web well no it might have been in print, but Matt Fisher, I think, it was like the nine things you should know about Syria. Ukraine. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you can't just put something on the web to get clicks, because we, we were reporting on the news, so like some, some of that stuff resonates with the audience and some of it doesn't. Um, there's probably fewer people interested in like the, the serious news piece about the Ukraine, but there's like a lot more people that would look at the gallery, um, you know, and I think that's why we do both, right? Because there's different types of people that want to deep dive into something, and then there's people that want just want to understand on a surface level what these stories mean. And I think it brings up a good point, going back to the point Lauren made earlier about imagery and its place in communicating versus our uh, linear verbiage and following text. Um, so bringing it sort of outside of current events um, and coming back into like a more creative creative perspective, Matt, mm -hmm. um, Matt, Matt works on a daily basis to take that sort of horizontal verbiage and turn it into imagery. Um, and so um, he's, he, he really is helping out clients, our clients or his clients or whomever, to empower them. So my question to you is, what does it mean to arm your client or organization from a creative perspective? That's a, that's a good question. Um, well, someone was talking earlier about, well, I think you were talking earlier about uh, when you were giving your NYC.gov client uh, the, the work, you weren't just providing them with a product. You were actually, uh, the, I, the huge team was giving them some rules and some guidance around what images to use in the future, right? That, so that's essentially arming your client. As, as creative folks, we could you know, sit in our corners and draw all day, come up with some beautiful imagery that's gonna be as impactful, if not more impactful, than words. Um, but to be able to show a client, this is what you're doing from now on, this is what's gonna align with your brand, and this is what's gonna help you communicate in a very consistent and effective way with the people that you want to talk to and get them to do the things that you want to do, to actually change behavior, that's really arming them. That's giving them more than a website or giving them more than a social stream or a, or a Twitter handle that they could use. It's actually showing them, 
you, I'm now passing the torch to you. This is something that you have to own yourself uh, and not just keep coming back to a creative uh, uh, group or, or mind when you need something. Yeah. Something to push out. And, and specifically to N NGOs and policymakers and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, we all come from an industry that is that is tangential to that. We're not necessarily in the thick of it. So, yeah. what, I have another question to follow up with you. Um, from what other industries do you believe these organizations, as such, and you, uh, need to take lessons from? Well, that's good. Uh, so, <laughs> I think that the NGOs and other organizations could look to themselves uh, to see what each other's doing. I know a lot of these uh, organizations will act in silos. And they'll occasionally look to either their funders or their grant makers uh, or the governments uh, to do their case studies on. But very few of them we've seen will look to each other. Now, this is a very common practice in, in business where one company, one corporation is going to look at every other case study that they could possibly get their hands on in order to improve what they do. Uh, but as we've seen uh, with infographics and using imagery, which, by the way, was very surprising. It's, uh, it's always surprising to hear that. They are just now sort of picking up the idea of infographics and imagery. Like you said, Timor, we live in this industry. We, we I mean, I've, I've been living with infographics since I was in college. Um, so, so to, for us to see someone behind the ball, it's, it's a little surprising, but you know, we're willing to help them out. I think the same thing goes with case studies within the NGOs and, and associations. They, they need to sort of break out of themselves and go look at what someone else is doing, even if it's in, in a completely unrelated field. They're still doing some very important communication stuff that needs to be seen by other people. I'd love to add to that too, if you don't mind. I think that was a great, great question. Because I come from the entertainment and media space initially. So I used to work at MTV and then I started an agency that was that I had prior to this one. And so we were always out front because I guess we had nothing to lose and you know, not huge budgets a lot of times when you're just beginning to break acts. So digital was like, okay, like give it to me, let's see how this can work. And so I really think that maybe not for maybe the more outlandish parts of it or the twerking Miley Cyrus no. parts of it, but for the parts that really resonate with people, especially if you're dealing with something that is along the lines of social good, 18 to 34, whatever, that's the area where you look because that's where you're competing every day. So, and if somebody's posting something on Instagram that is hot, interesting, um, creative, humorous, no matter how great that infographic is or whatever about cancer, whales, whatever, it's not going to fly. And that's what I think is really the saddest thing at the end of the day and why I started this new agency is because I really want to infuse a lot of that heat into what's going on with the public sector space. It's more important than a record, right? So it should really resonate just like that. So Lauren, give us give us um, maybe your top three examples, either uh, globally recognized brands or the top three industries that are actually utilizing these mechanisms the strongest? In terms of digital storytelling or just using the image? Um, your call, imagery or digital, I think the imagery and digital storytelling are cousins, you know, so. Um, I think that it's still about the entertainment industry. I think it will always probably be about music probably being first in terms of trying something and seeing how it works. And um, here's what I almost know is going to happen, but I don't know exactly the form it's going to take, but it'll, it'll be this nice convergence of like offline and online. So whether you like Kanye West or not, you know what, everybody stopped when it was about throwing that video to several different buildings at the same time in several cities simultaneously, and it exploded offline and online. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really matter whether you were feeling him or not. It was like, what, what is that about? Like, I need to kind of process that. This is what we need to see more of. How can we be able to bring these things um, into a space that just makes people stop when they've got their phone and their bit and the tablet and this and that? And videos have always been about storytelling, right? So how, can you tell it on the wall? Can you tell it on the screen? Like, how yeah. does that happen? Yeah. So I think that would be, like, probably a, a key one. And then yeah. I'll throw it to my other panel. Sure, I mean, harking back to what, what uh, Matt was saying, the, um, we, we've worked with a lot of nonprofits over time. UNDP came up uh, in my mind when you were speaking because it was exactly, you know, we started to work with them. We thought we were just going to redesign UNDP.org, I think it is. Um, and then we realized reading their literature, they were 
completely talking to themselves. <laughs> the, the language, every, everything, everything. They weren't thinking about the, any, anyone else besides their own organization. And they didn't see, because they were working together, they didn't see that as a problem really until, until we came to talk to them. So what, turned, what started as a design project really turned into a content strategy project for, for us. And we worked with them to soften the language, make it more open, use words that people understand, that a lay person can understand, really focus a lot of their stories on the impact that, uh, so their uh, United Nations Development Program, the impact that they have in their nation countries and really opening it up uh, so that anyone who's working on a project can tell their own story too. Um, and we find that a lot of nonprofits and NGOs that work with us really like that we have that experience in uh, you know, the for-profit space. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the things that, that we train them on or work with them on are, are specifically about running more like a business. You know, a little bit less consensus driven, a lot more agile in the lower case sense, uh, just moving nimbly, making more decisions, and, and taking a little risk and playing more, yeah. more in the space. So if I were to ask you the question, to what industry could you best compare the necessary practices of these type of organizations, so like in non-for-profits or NGOs, what industry would you say? To me, it's, it's I'm, I'm really industry agnostic. I just look at what people are trying to achieve. So um, we worked with uh, energy.gov, and uh, they actually had a lot of, they, they, their challenge was making the content meaningful to people, you know, why, and, why, and, and a reason for being. Why would you go to energy.gov? You know, what do you need from them? So they actually had a breadth of data that we thought was super interesting and could impact so they were able to tell a story about, uh, a much stronger story about how to save money on your energy bill. They had all this data, they had no idea what a gold mine they had. Um, so for us, it's really looking more at uh, just finding a strong analogy uh, as opposed to a specific industry. You know, do, do, who is your audience? Mm -hmm. Is it broad and it's kind of everyone and, and the experience needs to be really accessible or can you speak to a specific audience who's doing that well? Yeah. What are they trying to achieve? You know? So the, 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 the key thing here, and sometimes the hurdle or the trouble, is that you, 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 know, you baby the puppy, you teach the puppy its ways, and then you set the puppy free. Um, we all have had this where you know, the puppy has grown up and is roaming, roaming around, finding, finding little berries to eat or whatnot. Um, but my question to all of you then, and, and we've all been in this situation, is how can you empower the, these clients, let's say, to, to, to re-perpetuate? Um, to maintain this practice, you know, you you your the puppy's riding the bike right now. How does the puppy remember to put air in the tires? Well, you, you said we're content strategy. I think that was uh, mm -hmm. is one of the best examples of it. And oftentimes they 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 forget when they buy a content strategy from us. This is not our content strategy. This is not something that the agencies are are going to just be following. This is this is your content strategy. This is something you have to follow. It's a set of guidelines and rules for you. Um, so once they once that clicks and they're like, oh, well, this is something that I do from now on, not just, not, I'm not telling you what content I'm gonna be giving you, yeah. I'm telling you what content you need to write and what images you need to start providing. I think that helps them out a lot. I think I would add in analytics too. Um, you can talk about all like the slickness and sexiness in the world, but if you can't ground it into something that's tangible like this infographic did X or that image did Y, it really doesn't matter. And um, a lot of this is being thought through quite understandably, logically rather than emotionally. So I would say it's about um, using analytics almost as that carrot yeah. that propels people to want to continue to do whatever yeah. campaign you set up for them or what have you. I was talking um, yesterday with, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Participant Films, so Jeff Skull's company in Hollywood behind uh, Siriano, George Clooney, etc. So now they have Pivot Television, but they also have TakePart.com. This is about creating a digital space for those who are interested in causes, etc., to get involved, but around image and digital storytelling and more. And so we were just talking about the fact that we had read these same statistics recently that 54% of people, allegedly, want to get involved in causes but don't know how. They're just waiting for this, right? So if you can take that statistic and then maybe marry it with uh, some kind of, um, I don't know, either research or um, uh, some kind of case study or proof of concept in terms of what you've done and connect those two, then that, I think, it, it says it all. We don't have to really even add any extra. So I would say add the analytics. But that sure. analytics comes with a little bit of training, too, because in the, 
NGO and, and association world, they can be very underwhelming when they first start out. Yeah, and they look at their analytics no, and, no, and no magic, them. right? Yeah. Everybody thinks like, I put this out, so I should be yeah. good, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll tell them that they got 67 shares on this infographic, and they'll be like, that's all. That's all I got? I paid that much for it? And then they're like, no, wait, just wait. That 67 grows exponentially. That's how, that's how it works. Yeah, and I think it's important to, to you know, set goals to break previous goals. And I think coming from the non-creative side, where like many of these clients and these uh, organizations are, having metric-based success is extremely important. Um, you brought up a good point about di digital space and imagery and then coming back to digital storytelling. Um, and in, inspiring people to do things. Many people come to websites like the Washington Post to be inspired, to become aware. Um, journalism is a really important part of motivating uh, an audience to be educated for anything. Um, for the Ukraine, for example, so let's just keep the Ukraine. Um, so my question though, because this is part of the topic, is what is data journalism? Tell us a little bit about that. Lauren. Yeah, no, Lauren, you. Okay, and then share with us some of the best practices. Jump in as One well of you. Too, you are at that, but well, I have a follow-up follow 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 question, so you can jump in and I'll follow up with you. It's more tricky. There are no wrong answers, but... Yeah, like explain a little bit about data journalism and some of the best practices behind it. Yeah, so I mean, we do a lot with data. We have, you know, we'll have like election data, right? Like. How much money are the Clintons spending, or how much money have the Clintons spent since they were in the limelight, since, since the days back in Arkansas? Like looking at that and, and coming up with you know some trend lines and some 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 understanding from experts to like sort of make sense of all of that data is something very important. Um, and I think only really big news organizations actually can do that. Yeah. Um, and I think you know on the flip side of that, there's also like you know, the visual side of, of what you do with that. Like, you know, you can set up a database and like throw a search box on top of that thing and filter some columns, but like that's not helping anybody. Um, that's only helping somebody that really understands that world. But like most people that are going to stumble upon this thing really need a little bit more guidance to understand what that type of thing might mean. So like you know, the, the graphic side of that, how you visualize that is very important and there's, you know, that's a science. Like, there's so many different ways you can do that. Um, well, I have two ways that I can ask you about right <laughs> now. So, um, could you speak to us about the different uses and, and differences between data visualization and data presentation? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it really s depends on, um, one, what it is that you're trying to break down and what the story is, and two, who your audience is. And if you know those two things, I think you can determine whether or not you have a, an intensely graphical database of something that's explaining a very complicated thing. Like we just did one, um, I mean, we do them all the time. But there's like, you know, when, when you have a, a tremendous amount of data and you have to boil it down for somebody to understand or even like put themselves in their, in, into like that story, like how does this affect me, um, you know, then you can really start to kind of understand the best, simplest way to tell some of these complex stories. Um, so I think the difference really is like, you know, you can you can have a poll, like you can poll the Catholic Church and like, does everybody think the Pope's doing a good job? And then you could say, great, that, yeah, so we have like interesting factoids. We could put those on like cards with share buttons and like throw those all over the site because they're portable and yeah. people will pass them around. Or you have some like more complex story that needs to be woven together a little bit more. And I think it really does depend on the audience. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think that's completely 100% valid. Um, Matt, from the, from the creative perspective, again, uh, Matt, the blender of words that processes out the best types of smoothies relative to the audience. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you've seen the difference in data visualization and data presentation and what is potentially for this specific audience, NGOs and associations, policymakers? Yeah, yeah. What's, uh, what's more effective to them? Well, coming from, coming from a design background, um, the, we have seen data presentation, and just to give you guys some background on the difference between the two words, because the, the, it's a very, very subtle difference. Data presentation is making data, words or numbers or percentages or something, just look good, right? It's, it's, it, it's 
something that you'd see in like BuzzFeed or wherever, where it's just really well designed, good color choice, it's on brand, but it's just data presented that way. Um, data visualization is taking that data and representing it in another way that makes you comprehend the data in a better way. Uh, a great example of the most simplest form of data visualization is a pie chart. Right? A pie chart takes a percentage of something and it shows you what that actual percent, you know, a percent of, of the 100% of the circle, this is what 30% looks like. And all of a sudden you're absorbing data not just with the, the logical part of your brain, your left brain, but you're now you're absorbing with the right part. You're actually seeing what that data looks like. So the visualization of the data is actually more, it's a little more sophisticated than just data presentation. Um, another example would be uh, the periodic table of elements something we've all seen before, is data presentation. We're just sort of listing out the, the, the atomic value and what the short name of the, of the element is. Um, the Bohr model of an atom is data visualization. That thing doesn't exist. That no atom looks like that, where it's got circles and the baby's shell and little dots around it. It's just not true. It's dead. Yeah. But, but <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> I'm surprised the word valence came out. I'm like, wow, science. <laughs> right, right. That's a throwback. Um, uh, so it, that, that is data visualization. It's taking a raw set of data and showing it to you in a way that lets you comprehend it in easier form. That is the core of infographics. So to your question, uh, or to, your, to your point, we see, as, as creatives, data presentation as a degradation, as a, as a lesser form of data visualization. So the, the true, a true infographic should have a whole series of, of charts that present data in a, in a way that makes you think about it differently, and they all interact and intertwine, not just several boxes with pretty percentages. Um, yeah. So from the web presence side and, and, and the infographic side, but specific to user experience, um, is there a home for both of these on specific sites? Is there, do, do you encourage one form or the other better? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's, it's similar to what Sarah said. I think it depends on the audience uh, and the story you're trying to tell and the organizational capacity that you have. So you look at an NYC.gov, it will be a long time before they can create a data visit, frankly, before they have a visual story to tell, at least on the main.gov, right? In terms of the stories they're telling, it's what's going on with plowing, what's going on with the pre-K program. These aren't they're complex issues, but more on an emotional and political sense. It's not you know, the story itself is that complex. That said, I could see uh, if, let's say that the pre-K initiative, which we know is a big deal for de Blasio now, uh, became something that was a really complex and contentious issue, and there were stories to tell behind it, database could be a good tool for them, assuming that they had the right help or the right people in-house. Uh, but it really, to me, at like anything in design, it has to do with your priorities and and optimizing with your limited resources. You know, just being smart about how you spend your time. So, in the post example, I think this is another interesting thing that's happening. You're seeing a lot of news organizations start to play with storytelling more because news has become more commoditized. Yeah. So you can search in Google and get a story from a lot of different places. And unfortunately, people have stopped caring as much where the source is yeah. or what the source is. Um, but uh, exactly, and, and just get the background as fast yeah. as possible. Whether or not it's true might not always matter, unfortunately. Um, but uh, wait, it's not all true. Yeah. Except for that. Uh, uh, right. Yeah, that's model. true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the war model is totally true. Uh, but uh, so I think that that that's actually a really nice thing that's starting to happen is uh, really serious news organizations and other content creators yeah. are being forced, but also getting to experiment more in the medium and, and in how they visualize data, telling much more interesting stories in the same amount of space. Well, you brought up two good points just there. Um, one from the NYC.gov about education and how the story actually turned into a longer story. Um, and the same thing with many of the news issues that, that we race to post and we race to like, be the first to know. Um, if any of you are watching House of Cards, you can see how a little planted seed can grow into a jungle. Um, so it goes from short form, uh, very quick digital storytelling, I'll just bring it back to the topic, um, into long form storytelling. So Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, could you speak to us about long form storytelling? What is it? What does it entail? How is it best used? Sure, yeah. Um, well, we have a lot of really good writers at 
post. We have a lot of reporters, but there are like a, a batch of people that are really good at like crafting the word, the story. Um, and we also have people that are, um, you know, experts at covering, um, you know, different news stories or interviewing people, um, doing portraits, um, and in a photographic way. Mm -hmm. We have the same kind of staff, um, our video team, we have documentary video journalists that go out and tell these stories um, in, in a multitude of ways. Um, and we try to pinpoint, we have like weekly, oh, bi-weekly, I go once a month. <laughs> <laughs> but we have meetings where we try to pinpoint these things that are coming up in the next couple of months. But we'll each Well, it's a long-term story. Kind right. Of long -term. Well, and these things take a lot of time to put together. So, you know, you try to pinpoint these stories. Like, we just did one about a family who had two sons that were killed in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they had one brother that was still alive. And that was, like, such a crazy story. And we knew, like, most of them are really kind of downers. Mm -hmm. not, like, I mean, there's nothing great about that story. But, like, it really makes you think about you know, all sorts of different types of, not just like the, the family story that they're trying to tell, but like the policies with what we're doing and like there's like larger issues that yeah. are there, right? So like we try to we try to see what these stories, you know, down the road are gonna be and we staff them up and we um, we used to sort of do them like as a one off where we would just like get a ton of people to work on the story and it would be the thing that we worked on for months and then it's like there's our thing. Um, but we've gotten a lot more systematic about it. We've created templates that sort of empower more people to be able to do this type of work. Um, and we've, we've run maybe two or three a week um, in this template where we're sort of trying to, what we're trying to do really is weave together the, the best way of telling these stories that instead of having these like desperate um, elements like throughout the site, we're trying to pull them together so that it's more of a narrative. Um, whether that's a photo or you know, a strong video, like they're put together rather than I mean, the video in the video template and the article in the article template and all of that. So that's really sort of the gist of it. Um, you know, you can do a long form story without those elements, but like, again, people, people really love image and they love like the visuals of something and the like a sense of place to see you know, like, what you know, what the writer is talking about. Um, you know, so yeah. I think we've it's been very successful to do that. Well and if you've looked at the Washington Post.com and seen some of these long term stories being told and the, the team does a wonderful job of executing it and it, it, it almost captured you like the Magic Kingdom like you feel like you're in another world by these stories because they're just done so well. Um, you did bring up couple interesting ways that these stories could be told, different manners, maybe it's a video, maybe it's an animation. Um, Lauren, what, what do you think, um, which tools and which elements of long story, of, of long term, sorry, of long -term, long -term storytelling um, are enhancing outreach, are enhancing the storytelling process? Um, in terms of like image versus video versus text versus whatever? Yeah, which, which vehicle? I think that it really depends on what is being communicated and to whom. Um, I think video is always going to be, you know, a, a hot piece. That depends on, of course, the number of seconds or, or minutes, how that's chopped up. But I think really the main thing to keep in mind is that none of this is kind of standalone. And maybe you alluded to that a little bit before, Matt, about um, you know, like a magic bullet or whatever. No matter what any of us are kind of talking about here tonight, I think it's important to keep in mind that it should be part of a larger campaign, yeah. right? So I always think of it as like spokes on the wheel, right? So it's not like an infographic is done or a video is done, and yeah. like that's pretty much all there is, is to it. I think it's important to keep in mind, well, when are these released and how, and how does it fit into a larger context, both with traditional and you know digital then i think it begins to make sense and so whereas you might drop some exclusive video at one point then maybe it becomes important to do something that's like um, image driven you know yeah. later on so long as it still fits within this overall kind of story and i think it's certainly much more i don't know like formatted how one would do a story like for the washington post but sometimes, you know, I'll see like these infographics or whatever, I'm sure you guys have too, and you're like, looks really good, 
very slick and all the info is there. What, what, what was the story? Like, yeah. you know, it's kind of like story, mean beginning, middle, and end. So what was it that, it, um, you know, the person was trying to kind of communicate to kind of, I think, keep that in mind so that it really sinks in with the viewer yeah. or the reader because otherwise I just see it during my day and things like that was hot and love that, like, tone of red but I don't really remember it. And I think this is why stories are so important. Because if I sit here and tell you a story about myself, you'll remember it. If I give you simply statistics, eh, you know, it'll hit or miss. Yeah. I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind in general on how one, or what tools one wants to use to tell the story overall, and yeah. to see if it really is a, a story at the end of, of everything. Well, I love the, the spokes on a wheel analogy because every single spoke could represent a different team or contributor to basically creating a holistic and strategic plan exactly. to communicate whatever story that is. Um, so timing uh, brings up a question for Matt. Um, and I'm, spokes on a wheel is a visual analogy. Yeah, spokes on, and I was thinking of the, <laughs> the pie chart that you said earlier. Um, but, but how I see that is, you know, it's also confined inside that wheel, which means everything happens in there. Things, things aren't happening on a linear basis, which oftentimes I think in specific industries, uh, decisions are made and then resources are channeled based upon immediacy. Um, I have a question for you though, Matt. At what point do you think, or when would you recommend the creative aspect coming into the planning of that spoke? If, if I had my druthers, it'd be in the very beginning, before it even happened. In fact, I know, I've, I've known some some clients to say, I don't even know what I want, and they let us loose to come up with the original, uh, even before they say, oh, I want to engage you for content creation, or I want to engage you for, for infographics, or brand assets, or digital assets, or anything else. They're like, I don't know. I just like you guys. Yeah. Uh, and I think, Aww. and I think, well, yeah, occasionally they say that. Yeah, like um, us on Facebook, too. Right. <laughs> Mark Lincoln. But the, the clients that, that we can do the best amount of work for, we engage as early as possible. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, we are treated, uh, I, call it, I call it where their hands, where they have an idea, and they, they draw something out on a napkin, or they have this, this digital plan that they want to put forth, or they, they've done their own user experience research, and they think that they know what their, their audience wants. And then they come to us and say, OK, we have the thought behind it. Now we just need the hands. We need you to, to execute, which is fine, and we'll do that too. Uh, and once we prove ourselves, once any agency proves themselves as being great executors, then they sort of get their foot in the door, and then they're like, why don't, why don't we show you what else we can do? We can actually, uh, we, we think that the story that you came to us with could use some tweaking. Even, even before uh, you realize what executables you wanted, we can help you with the stuff even before. Um, so I think that the best stories uh, don't come from data, they come from an idea, and then the data ends up supporting that. So if they don't have the idea, if they have the data, that's great. We can help them come up with uh, that idea behind it. And then McCall, to that point, um, again, I'm in the industry, so I'm a little bit uh, more versed in this, but with, when it comes to user experience, do you agree that the user experience department or aspect should be integrated at the conception? Beginning, middle, and end all the time. <laughs> Uh, no, yes. uh, so I think what's, what's interesting, even for us as a company, we are, uh, our roots are very much in user experience and, and design and, and, and uh, graphic design. Um, and what's been interesting is, and we've been digital, you know, started digital only um, and actually expanded out into other things. Uh, and what's interesting about digital specifically is, uh, and, and the way we've matured is uh, that it really brings, it takes an interdisciplinary team from the get-go, I believe, to create an amazing product. The nice thing is you can really experiment and begin to launch things, you can learn from them, you can change, you can take risks. Uh, and, and so one thing that we're, we really work with with our clients is to stop thinking about it as sort of that the, the old school print model where you kind of start with, I mean Sarah can probably fill these in much better than I can, but you know, it's, it's very linear and even our design process used to be very, very linear. Strategy into uh, wireframes, uh, which are, for those of you who don't know, it's kind of like the design without the color in a sense, uh, into 
you know, whatever, X, Y, Z. Uh, and what's working more and more for us is to get everyone together early. Everyone contributes in the way that they think, the way that they add the most value. So our user experience people are doing research, we're designing, our strategists are looking at uh, competitive analogies, understanding the market, um, and you know our graphic designers are starting to experiment with look and feel, and, and there's a lot of overlap in digital yeah. around all of those. So um, that's that's also how we encourage our clients to to work with us and to start working. You know, when we do pass off that baton. So red red flag as a native Washingtonian and being centered around all these uh, uh, people who are new to this digital storytelling. Um, you mentioned the term take risks. Oftentimes, uh, our industries here in Washington are averse to that term and want to run away from you for taking risks. Everyone take, just wants to blend right in. <laughs> yeah, take risks. Be like, I no earmarks are allowed. Um, we just need to be beige and you know <laughs> keep it keep it under the radar. Um, however, personally, what I've noticed is that uh, many associations, NGOs, and nonprofits have been. Uh, reaching out to people to push them to take risks. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned sort of relative industries, so all four of you. Um, let's talk best practices here, because we're, we're dealing with, I think, an audience that is uh, willing to listen to us, um, um, are trying to encourage the administration, their administration, to really take risks, like you said. But what are some best practices that, for let's say selling points, Best practices and selling points that you that you in this process working with an NGO or nonprofit association or a policy whomever it is in Washington within the Beltway, um, what would be your top two? Whoever's ready can raise their top hand. Two best practices. Yeah, best practices. You know. In terms of like digital storytelling or just image or. Uh, I'm thinking more in in, 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 in having people take risk in terms of digital storytelling. Um, I think all four of you are very four different components of a digital story. Um, so each of you might have different best practices or recommendations or uh, ways to persuade or, or to calm that risk. So uh, uh, I'll start. I think so. One of the things so we work with um, a lot of for-profit companies that also are very very scared of the idea of taking risks. We work with American Express, uh, who last year paid. Uh, 12, so not technically last year anymore, paid out $700 million for you know one line of print that wasn't quite right, you know, a lawsuit. I mean, the risks are, the, the damage to the, to the company and their brand is really serious, um, and they've a lot of uh, legal compliance and fears, and, and they're, they're justified. Um, it, they're all built to protect consumers, basically. Uh, so part of the way that we work is we built in, for example, user testing into our design process, prototyping into our design process as a design tool. Those, so the way I see it, it's our job to create a bold design that takes risks, uh, but do that in the safety of uh, either the, the, the collaboration you know, within that and test it with people, uh, or pilot something small and launch it to a small group where you can take those risks. So uh, another example, although they take a lot of risks, uh, we just launched, and worked with Ted to launch the redesign of ted.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went through the process that everyone was saying healthcare.gov should have, right? They did a very private and small beta, um, tested with family and friends, then an invite only beta, now it's public beta, so you can still flip back and forth, but anyone can play with it. Until the, the designs and, the, and the, the risks that they took, it's sort of measured and calculated. So it doesn't actually, what's going on now is with things like what with healthcare.gov is, you, you spend a ton of money and time and resources on one giant, mammoth project that if that thing fails, you, which it did, you see the implications. You know, it's so much money lost. Actually, people's lives were very negatively impacted. Mm -hmm. They could not get health insurance. Yeah. That's, you can't get much more basic than that. So uh, it's easy to say from the sidelines, you know, what, yeah. what could have been better. But I think it's the idea of what is that risk of taking a calculated risk. A great design is a smart hypothesis that moves things forward yeah. for the client and the users. Uh, and then you test and iterate until you're in a safer space. So I think what your recommendation, the best practice, is uh, easing the client through a controlled environment, through a subtle controlled environment based upon one or multiple separate uh, demographics. Yeah, and, and, by, and by the way, physical in physical design space, you'd never launch a new bicycle without testing it. Exactly that right. Right? Yeah. And, and now the risks in digital are becoming yeah. that, that high. Yeah. People cannot get healthcare. You know, that's, yeah. it's, it's serious stuff. 
You know, I, I, I actually want to want to piggyback off that because not not only should this is my recommendation for best practice. Not only should we should should you and we and the agencies and everyone be testing their products uh, and the technology behind it, but you should also be testing your stories. Um, how many times do, does a story have to get run through an editor or, or however many levels of editors before it's actually digestible and ready for ready for consumption? Um, one of the easiest ways that we found to quickly test stories, if you don't have a lot of time and budget to test your stories with focus groups or, or anything else, is to present it. Is to go is to go to someone, whether hopefully you'll know them, I was gonna say whether you know them. Don't <laughs> um, is to go up to is to talk to someone and say, here's my here's my story, whether you're gonna tell it through an infographic, or whether you're gonna tell it through an article, or whether you're gonna tell it through a digital experience, here's what the story is. And if you can say it in a couple sentences and they can get it instantly. And your story is, is that's gone through a level of testing. Uh, and if you can say, present it, like actually go from a start, a beginning, middle, and end, just like any presenter would in, in, their, in their track, then you've, then you've come farther than a lot of people have with their stories. Because a lot of times with the infographics that fail, there's, there is no middle, beginning, and end. If, if that person tried to present that story, it would just make no sense whatsoever. If they tried to have it come out of their mouth, it would just be data that didn't have a point to it. So you're almost pitching before yeah, you sell it. Yeah. In a way, yeah, you're pitching. You're pitching your story. Or you're trying out different flavors of it um, before uh, you know pen gets to paper or pixel gets to screen. Interesting. I would totally agree with that. I think like what you're really saying there is like you're targeting some kind of content strategy, and I think that is the general idea, right? And like you have to have really clear cut goals before you start figuring out what color the logo should be and all of that stuff. Like you, like, you can't let an idea get too far without really understanding what you're trying to accomplish. And I think revisiting those goals throughout a process is really important. And I think, um, you know, it, it's also, depending on the size of an organization, I also think it's really good to get outside perspectives and mix the perspectives that you're working on a team with. So like, instead of having a bunch of reporters work together, it should be a reporter, an editor, a graphic designer, a UX person, a researcher, someone from advertising. Like, like make it happen, right? Like, you have to think about different facets of, of, of an idea before you kind of launch into it. To get to that point with uh, the specific audience, you know, within the government, that, that in itself is a risk. Um, oftentimes when we walk into a, a client meeting with a X large government organization, um, they have a goal, it's blurred. Um, they know they need something, but again, they, they don't understand that that's the, that's the component. So um, in order to get from, from the blur to having the buy-in of those components, uh, what are some tools that, that I guess you would utilize yeah, to get them there? I think you just have to be user-centric. Like, you're not making the website for the people sitting on the boardroom table. You're making it for the people that are going to healthcare.gov to sign up for health insurance. Like, that was the problem, right? So like if your goal is to make it easy for that to happen, like start with the user, yeah. right? And like figure out how how best to, to tell your story, to meet your goals from the perspective of the person that actually sees yeah. you. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So thus far we have the control, we've got pitch and we've got some goals. Lauren, you're coming from the entertainment industry, which is like one of the largest revenue generating industries in the world, and applying a lot of this knowledge now to it to a very similar and exactly opposite industry. So what were some of the best practices from your history that potentially could in, support our NGO friends to take a risk? Um, let's see, I don't know if I would say that it's maybe something that one would take from the entertainment industry mm -hmm. per se, but just in terms of fact that we're always doing research and forecasting and really looking at public opinion and what's going to happen next and why. I think that I would say best practice starts at making very well certain that you are organic and transparent from the very beginning. Because what we're seeing certainly more and more in terms of our research is that people are sniffing out anything that sounds kind of crafted slightly or has a little bit of hypocrisy or whatever, they delight in that. And I'm sure you see this if you go down into the comments or whatever. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is just, you know, Beyonce's recent like surprise album, and everybody thought it was amazing or whatever. If you went down
down into the comments, you saw so many interesting things like, oh, you guys have spent $15.99 for this, but not when like the Africa ad comes on and asks you to support a child. Or why are you doing this when I